Welcome to the Ultimate Farm Wife Podcast. On this channel, we're going to be discussing all things marrying a farmer, moving to the land and becoming integrated with a family farming operation. Whether you're moving to the farm for the first time or whether you're moving back into a family farming operation, we discuss the ins and the outs of all of it. So let's jump into today's episode. Hi, and welcome to the farm. Today we're talking with Nicole on You've Married a Farmer, Now What? Hi, Nicole. Hi, how are you? Well, thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your family and the farm. Okay, so I am a city born and bred girl. Um, I married my farmer about 17 years ago. It was a, he came up to visit me at my house and it was, oh, do you want to come down and cook for me? Mum and dad are going away. And I was just like, um, okay. <laughs> and I said to my mum, I said, oh, how about, how about I see if I can, you know, convince him to go on to Farmer Wants a Wife. But back then Farmer Wants a Wife was in the Women's Weekly. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't on television or anything. It was just a, like an advert in the Women's Weekly. And and she's like, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, anyway, he found his wife. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and he didn't have to go into Women's Weekly. Um, we have five kids. One was previous to marriage um, and the rest have been with um, my husband. Um, so it's it's hectic. There's a lot going on. She's now 22 and the rest are between 15 and 9 and they keep us on our toes, that's for sure. We live, in, we live on a farm about um, 30 minutes out of town, um, 30, 40 minutes out of town, depending on who's driving, of course, um, and it's three separate farms um, all within um, 10 minutes of each other. I call it the Bermuda Triangle where the money goes out and never comes in. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> uh, and there's about two and a half, two, I think it's 2,400 acres at the moment and we also have a bit of lease blocks either side of the farm as well. So, yeah, that's that's our, our life in a nutshell. <laughs> Definitely keeping busy. <laughs> yes. So tell me more about this dinner where you, you went down and you cooked for your now husband. Yes, he, he invited me and um, our daughter, we call her, um, down to the farm for the week because his parents were going away and he needed someone to cook for him. So, so we spent a lovely week um, kind of, I guess you would say it's a little bit like Farmer Wants a Wife now. You spend the week with the guy and figure out if you like him or not. And and from there we commuted because um, I lived in Canberra and he lived down in Victoria. We commuted for about six months. Yeah. Um, and then in the end it was like, well, you're either moving down or this is going nowhere. And I was like, okay, we're moving down. So April Fool's Day we packed up everything and moved down. And moved down. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, we've been here 17 years now. Absolutely. And big change from when you first moved there with, with one daughter to mm -hmm. now having the five kids and multiple farm assets. So yeah. tell me about how that history progressed and your roles in the farm as it's moved along. Okay. So my roles in the farm have never been huge. I've always just um, literally been the, can you drive us here? We need to move these vehicles here. Can you bring me lunch? I'm hungry. Can you bring me dinner? I'm hungry. Um, and wrangling the children and all the housework. So they, they, they are my main roles. They might not seem important, but for the farm to keep moving, Absolutely. they need to be done. Like he, he doesn't have time to do his washing. Let's just put it that way. There's no way he would actually wear clean clothes if he didn't have someone cleaning them. <laughs> It's the foundation of the farm. It is, yes. It's yep. the foundation and the glue that keeps the farm operating. And that is a big role. <laughs> it is a big role. I think some yeah, I think sometimes you don't see it as a big role because you're not out there working from, you know, sun up till sundown. You're you're pottering around the house sort of thing. And yeah, sometimes it doesn't it doesn't feel like a big role if if yeah, if you get yeah. what I mean. So we moved into another house on the farm. So his parents were in the main house. Um, we moved into a house that used to be his brother. He lost his brother a few years beforehand to a, a um, truck tipping accident. Um, so we moved in there and then his sister decided she wanted to come back and join 
the the farm as well. So we did a big shuffle. Um, she wasn't married at that stage. We had one on the way when she moved back. I think. Oh no, no, we might have been up to number two by then. <laughs> they all happened so quickly. Yeah. And so we did a big a farm within the same location came up for sale. So we went. Well, if we're bringing on the sister as well, we need to expand the farm. Yeah. So that down the track there's enough work for everyone. So we did that. So we did a real house shuffle. We went from the house that used to be his grandparents over to this new house. His parents went to the grandparents' house and his sister went to the main main farm. So it was and it all happened in one day. Wow. <laughs> Logistical feat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. There was boxes going. Okay. We lost a few couple of boxes. Like I don't know what happened to them. I think they got thrown out, but that's all right. We we managed to survive and we made it through. And then a couple of years after that, we we hit a roadblock where his sister wanted to have babies, and we, it got really ugly. Like it was one of those family disputes that that got pretty ugly. Everything's been sorted out now. Um, she ended up moving back off the farm and buying her own little farmlet. Um, that her and her husband, um, he works in mortgage, mortgage broking, uh, they run that and succession has now been sorted, which succession was tough as an outlaw um, because you, I can't say anything. It's not it's not up for me to decide what happens to, to what part of this and, and who gets what and that. So I just had to sit back and bite my tongue and just watch it unfold and it probably took about five years in truth be told, five years to actually get it done and sorted where everyone is happy and all on speaking terms again. So so that was a big step, a huge step for the farm and, and for all our families to be able to move forward and keep, keep you know, keep farming. I'm glad that it was eventually settled and that it yeah. did occur. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about the succession process? Because I do know that there are members in the community who are either wanting to start the process or yep. who are in the middle of it and some others who are in those rocky grounds and yeah. would really, really like a bit more insight into there is still a light at the end of the tunnel where you do talk. There is a still a light at the end of the tunnel and I think but sitting on the outside is even harder because you're watching your partner go through the family struggles and you're not, like I was never really a part of it because succession is so family orientated. It stays within the family realms is what I found. Um, I think it's just the, it's the letting go from the older generation. It's the making sure that those that aren't working and living on the farm get their fair share and the person who's actually working it actually gets what they need as well because, yes, you might get a huge farm, which is a, an amazing asset, but you don't get the $10,000 to spend on whatever you want or the, the $20,000. You get the farm, which is a great asset, and then you get all the debt that comes with it. <laughs> I think you just need to bear in mind that um, as an outlaw, you just – you need to take a step back and just let them work it out and just be there for your partner and let them talk it through. I think I didn't have a lot to do with it. I know it was very time consuming and there were there was one meeting where Trent just walked away and he was just like, I don't know if I want any of this. So like, I don't know if I want to be a part of this anymore, but keep talking because the talking will get you through it because then everyone knows um, what page they're on and and how everyone's feeling. And I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so when I'm going to focus on you in this scenario. Mm. So as the support person, as, you know, the farmer's wife, when succession started being a conversation on farm, mm -hmm. how were you feeling and how did you start setting yourself up for the long run because the planning does take a long time and the it's conversations take a long time. So <laughs> was there something in particular you did to set yourself up as a grounding for your yourself and your farmer then or is there something you would do um, or tell others would be a good place to set yourself up from at the beginning of those conversations? Yeah, I think just just knowing that it takes time, like it, it's going to take a long time and it's going to take a lot of energy and a lot of heartache in the end as well. Like it, it, it can break families apart and I 
think it's really important to stay grounded on the fact that you don't want those families. They are family. You don't want them to to fall apart. So you need to work on their relation, the relationship as the succession is going through, and try and as as an outlaw, I, I, I call myself an outlaw all the time. Step back, let yep. them work it out. Don't don't voice too much opinion because it's not what they need to hear. They need to work it out within the realms of the family unit. And I know that marrying into someone, you, you're part of the family, but it's still, it's not the same as being a sister or a brother or a mother or a father in that that thing. And I know we are going to have to do exactly the same thing when our kids get older because there's five of them, but at least we've got the knowledge of how we, we're hoping it'll all pan out, but it just depends on what the kids want to do in the end. Did you remove yourself from the situation? How did you step back and be able to remain? Um, it almost sounds like you needed to be neutral. How did you yeah. take that step back and remain neutral? Was there things that you would remind yourself, like it's about the relationships or it's yes. about giving them space or it's about how did you yeah. keep being neutral? I had, I, so being neutral, I had to be an ear for Trent as well when he needed to vent and he did need to vent, but I also needed to not get wrapped up in his vent and start bitching about my in-laws or about me, you know, my sister-in-law and all of that sort of stuff. I needed to, to remember that they were still his family and that they needed the respect that he needed as well. And in doing so, I would, I, I hoped that, you know, the brother-in-law and brother out, outlaw would do the same for his family um, and and his wife as well. So, yeah, you just sometimes I had to bite my tongue, yeah, and it was hard. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it's hard. It's hard, but um, it, they worked it out. So, yeah. So glad that they kept the communication going and they yes. worked it out. Yeah. So they went from having, you know, originally, you know, their three children on farm and yeah. then – two children, and now you four, and your husband. Four children. There's another sister as well. Okay. <laughs> she married a farmer, so she's okay. She's <laughs> So at the end of the su- succession journey, I feel like I should cover some in the middle, but at the end of the succession journey, <laughs> how did it end up finishing and yeah. how did everyone feel grounded and be able to move on with just their family relationships and not the family farming relationships. Okay. So it finished up that um, Trent inherited the farm with all the debt and he ended up paying out one of his sister early. So he's been doing that over the last two to three years, paying her out. That has been a little bit hard on him, like watching her spend the money on what she wants to spend it on, that sort of thing. So that's been very um overwhelming in times and a little bit he just walks away when when she's you know talking and and going on about what they're doing with this renovation and that renovation he just walks away now because it's it's just not worth the fight it's not worth um the arguments you know it's just they're they're at a good place where they can be in the same room and the the kids that's the main thing we were focused on making sure the kids have a relationship as well as slowly building their relationship back up. So, yeah. Um, the other sister will inherit her stuff when the um, when Trent's parents pass, um, and she's fine with that. She's crazy. No. No. She's going through her own succession, being an outlaw with her farming family as well. So she knows she knows what it's like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I am really excited to share with you this episode's sponsor, Sarah Steele Conveyancing. You may remember Sarah from Season 4, Episode 2, back when we were called The Rural Mum. My conversation with Sarah in that interview shared a lot of insights into her 10 years of being on the farm, from moving there initially from town to dealing with emergencies operating unreliable machinery, keeping up to date with what's going on on the farm, adjusting to the evolving family as they grew and the kids become older. And Sarah emphasizes the significance of not having all the answers, embracing the learning experience, but also 
being prepared and what that meant for her and her family in emergency situations on farm. I will link Sarah's interview in the show notes below, so be sure to go back and listen. But let's talk about her business. Sarah, you talk about a lot of flexibility and how important it is to your business. Tell us about that. Nine to five is something that most of us have to work. So how do you get your personal things done? By contacting Sarah Steele Conveyancing, you can call me, text me or email me outside of these hours. And more often than not, I'm more than happy to talk. I get the benefit of time with my family during daylight hours and you get the benefit of my time and professional services outside of nine to five and on Saturdays and Sundays. Efficiency is important to you at Sarah Steel Conveyancing. Tell us why that is. I know when I choose that I need to do something, yesterday is the time that I want it done. And I take that same approach into my clients matters. Time is very important and getting your matter from start to finish as efficiently as I can is my number one. Sarah, why is being local so important when you're choosing a conveyancer? When you work in the Central West, you know the things to look for that aren't disclosed in a contract. That can make a big difference to a client at the end of the day, knowing all the things about a property, even when they're not disclosed in the contract for you. Sarah, what sets you apart from other conveyancers? Setting up this business, the client's needs have always been number one. I often think about what I want from professional services and try and develop these policies into the business's approach. What made you want to start Sarah Steel Conveyancing? I opened Sarah Steel Conveyancing as I wanted a business that would take a client from start to finish using me, me alone, and that way we could develop a plan that was started on day one and that was seen through right until the very end, settlement day. You have a very distinct method. How does that help people who are using you? From our first contact, we will make a plan that is unique to you and I. We will see this plan through, right through to settlement, and you will benefit from my professional skills and services from start to finish. If you would like to find out more about how Sarah Steele Conveyancing can help you, please check out her links in the show notes below. And after listening to this episode, don't forget to go back and watch Sarah's interview, Season 4, Episode 2, which is also linked in the show notes below. Now let's get back into today's episode. So it sounds like there is still a lot of support and guidance that is needed even once succession has finished. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about is there different things that you do like on a daily, weekly quarterly basis just to check in with your farmer and to check in with yourself and the kids to just make sure everyone is still trucking along and getting the support that they need. Yeah we we tend to organise during winter months we do football so no matter what football and netball are every weekend and that is it's all our outlet away from the farm especially Trent he gets to go and talk to people that um don't talk farming all the time. <laughs> There's a lot of farmers in the football community, but they try and, and talk about football and other stuff as well. So um, that is a huge outlet over the, the winter period when it's a little bit, I, I would say, quieter, but I don't think, I think that's a misconception. Like when, when you first move on to the farm, they're like, oh, when things get quieter, when things get quieter, and you're like, 17 years later going, when's it going to get quiet? It doesn't. Don't believe them. Don't believe it. <laughs> Every time there's something that always pops up, or oh, we've just got to put these crops in, we've just got to do this, you know. So, yeah, dragging. Which is what you're doing right now. <laughs> dragging him away off farm um, helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, making sure he gets out there. And, and it's really hard, I find, as a farmer's wife, to plan anything at all because you could plan the most lavish night and go out to dinner and blah, 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 but the sheep or the crops will always intervene yeah. so <laughs> so so just be flexible like you need to be flexible need to be yeah. flexible <laughs> yeah absolutely mm -hmm. you're in the middle of dinner and you get that phone call can you just and you're just like yes darling 
Nicole, mm. it's been a really interesting journey that you have taken on the farm and I think you're one of the first people I have spoken to in my 60 interviews who has come through the other side of succession planning and is still on the farm yeah. and that's really great to hear mm -hmm. and you've mentioned that but where I was taking that sorry <laughs> I'm just so blown away with with your journey and <laughs> where you're up to and I really I hope I don't I don't see it I, I, we've just lived through it we've just had to get through it that I just don't I don't see it as a big deal until I'm talking to other people who are where it's all just falling apart and yeah and, that, and it's really hard for them it is yeah yeah, if you're enjoying listening along with us today and learning some tips, tricks and advice, then please like, subscribe and even share this interview with someone who you think would need to hear this information or who might benefit from other interviews done right here on this channel. Now let's get back in today's episode. To be. It needs to, as soon as your kids hit the ground, succession yeah. needs to be talked about. Uh, honestly, it is the only way to get through it through it. And even if you're only just talking about it for three years before you actually start rolling into actually doing something about it, planting those seeds in the the um, parents' minds needs to be there because they're not thinking about it. The, the older generation is not thinking about it. And um, if it doesn't get done, it can turn into a disaster as well. Yeah, right. absolutely. So how do you plant those seeds? Like what are we planting idea-wise? Because I hear mm. from the community that a lot of parents and parents-in-law are up to the stage where they're wanting to wind back, but yep. they're not wanting to let go. And winding back for them means restricting the farming operation rather than mm. like helping assist in the handing over of the reins to take on the farming enterprise. So what type of seeds are placed and how are they placed? Are they placed through dinner conversation or are they placed through the sun? How is that had? So we had the same problem with um, Trent's dad wanting to step away and wanting to not be in control of everything he needed. So Trent slowly worked his way from one farm to another, like slowly um, took over management without Andy. I'm sure he realised, but without him putting up a fight because they were working together still. They were still on the farm. He was, he, well, he still is these days. He's 80 years old now and he still comes out and he's been out there um, disking up the paddocks to get them ready for sowing. So keeping them involved mm. but involved in a, in the things they want to do I think is really, really important. They don't want to be doing the crap jobs. They've done the crap jobs for X amount of years. They are entitled to do the jobs they want to do. So it's finding ways around them doing them their, those jobs to keep the farm moving forward, not getting stagnant and not, yeah, not wanting to pull back, like you said, because they think that's how, like, how they retire is to pull back and not let the farm go forward. Keep them involved in the farm moving forward in the jobs that they want to do, I think is is how Trent worked it. It wasn't easy at times and and often he'll, he'll come in and go, oh, Dad just needs to go home. Like, he's just being a nuisance because he's... He's one of those farmers that will ring and say, this needs doing now. It, it doesn't need doing now, but it needs doing now because Andy said it needs doing now. So we have dropped a lot of things to do those jobs just to, to smooth the path over. And, and in the entrance, like, it didn't really matter. Like, we got that done. It put us behind a little bit, but it didn't matter because it's kept him happy. So I think that's all it is, is they've been working these farms for so long you need to keep them happy to move forward. And it just makes your relationship easier as well. Yeah. Bearing in mind, you're still keeping yourself and your own family moving forward and happy as well. Like the, there's a bit of both. about that balancing act because that can be quite a balancing act. It is, it is. And that's when Andy started slowing down and just doing the things he wanted to do. We looked at bringing, because we were such a big farm and, we, and Bridie had gone on, his sister had gone off on her own, we looked at bringing in staff and that's how we worked our way around it so Trent could still have his family time, 
his dad could do the things he wanted to do and we were still moving forward with the farm. So we bought on a stock handler um, and they do all the cattle and sheep. I did forget to mention we do sh cattle, sheep and crops. So we've got all our um, eggs in different baskets. And then he bought on, oh, to start off, we went through a few, you've got to go through a few stuff to, to find the good ones. Um, so we had a few come and go. And then it must have been in just before 2020, so 2019, we had a young kid down the road who was done with schooling and um, he came on as an apprentice and he's been here ever since then. He took a couple of months off the other week because he hasn't had a couple of months off. Um, and, yeah, just by bringing on those extra staff, we have an, a casual stock handler as well who comes in with and does fencing and helps out with shearing and all of that sort of stuff. And then he bought on a truck driver as well, <laughs> you know, because the truck goes to Melbourne um, three or four times a week and he was he was doing it and it was taking him away from everyone. So we bought that on him on as well. And now they share that load of of taking the truck down to Melbourne. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. So tell me how you went around stepping into HR shoes and <laughs> <laughs> adding that to the basket of, of hats. So how did the farm get set up to bring on a work team? And then how did you bring on a work team and then setting aside, you know, a budget for that, even though you've inherited the debt of this succession plan we just we needed we needed to do it so when we talk about debt the farm that we're on is the major debt because that's the one we bought in when we um all decided that we wanted a piece of it listen the St Catherine side which is the original homestead um has no debt so it's yeah. machinery and this this land we're on now that um is the debt we carried over so technically we weren't carrying over inherited debt we would yeah does that make sense so but we just we had to work it in there, there was no way we could move forward without the workers um coming on board so we just had to fit it in the budgets but yeah 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 mm. And get yeah. bigger that's the only problem you bring on workers so you think oh let's just get a little bit bigger <laughs> this year's plan or motto is no projects no projects. We are just doing what we need to do yeah. at this size. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Husband take on the main role of finding the farm workers. Did you get external contracting services to try and source, you know, your employees and your team as is now and you were in for the final interview or did you do the whole lot yourself? So we did the interviewing, well, Trent did the interviewing. I just sat back and didn't say much because he's the one who knows what he needs. Um, he did put it through one of the the companies. I can't remember which one it was. He put an advert up and then he interviewed from there. So, yeah, yeah. And like I said, the, the teenager down the road, he approached us. His mother approached us actually and said, are you willing to take on this apprentice? Apprenticeship on farm? Yep, yep, he's finished it now. He's done his four years and just finished this year So and decided to stick around, which is really nice because I That's know. That's exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, he just turned 21 the other day, so, yeah. Yeah, apprentice. And going through those years of upskilling as well as the, the TAFE and education side of it. It was, oh, look, I'm not going to say it was hard. It was it was difficult, but we managed it. Like we just had to work around this schooling, um, which in the end it didn't seem to take out a huge chunk of the time. The The only problem was how far I had to go for one of the schooling. He had to um, drive, I think it's four or five hours away, to go to some of the TAFE courses that he needed to do, which was a bit of a, a pain because um, it took him out for the whole week pretty much. Yeah. And did the farm have to align with any of his units or the farm just did what the farm did and he mm -hmm. got signed off when you touched on certain aspects of his units? How did that work? The farm just did what it did and he just had to sign off as he was going. Yeah. 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 So when the, the TAFE tried to organise to come down to do some sort of stuff, well, we're like, 
we're not doing that now. You need to do this part first. (laughs) So they were um, pretty flexible. They could have been a little bit more flexible, but, you know, you work with what you can get these days, don't you? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So we've spoken about a lot in this episode already. We've spoken Mm -hmm. about succession planning, the timing that, really needs to be allowed and building on those relationships, working on those relationships to make sure everyone still has that family contact and the support that's needed behind it. We've spoken about once succession has finished, um, you know, the external supports that still need to come from you as the support person and the check-ins. And we've now spoken about diversifying the business through employment so that the farm can still continue to grow um, or become stable in its growth. So you've got employers, like you've got some building your employee basis Mm -hmm. and you're not doing any projects this year. (laughs) And what is it that gives you know, you the foundation of support to be able to have handled all of that over the time. Are there tips, tricks, advice and hacks you would give to the community who may be going through either all or all of those assets that we've just spoken about? There is light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> trust me. Like it, it's a slog. It is a slog, but there is light at the end of the tunnel and communication is key. You need to keep talking, otherwise things just fall apart. If you if you stop talking, then then it feels like one person's taking all the burden and, and you're probably feeling like you're taking all the burden or your husband's probably feeling like he's taking all the burden. As long as that communication's open, um, I think, you know, you can achieve anything really. Yeah. Yeah. And things feel particularly tough and neither is trying to, is wanting to sort of bridge that communication gap or just wanting some quiet time, how do you encourage the conversation to keep going? Do you focus on past, present, future? Is there a particular phrase you use to encourage the communication to keep coming? No, I just make sure I'm, if if he's, like if I can feel him closing down, I just make sure I'm not nagging but just letting him know that I'm here if, if he needs to to talk about it and I might not have the solutions and more times than any, I don't have the solutions. He is very good at talking to um, his neighbouring farmers as well. Um, we have a running joke that he's always on his phone to his boyfriend, um, which is the next on him. <laughs> if he's like, if you see his number on the phone, the kids will go, it's your boyfriend, dad. <laughs> so he has a very strong um, farming community network within the area, um, which has been a godsend. Like, really, if he needs to talk farming stuff and I just don't quite get it, he knows he's got three or four really good farmers in the area that he can ring and and have his moan to, and he will do that. Like, yeah, there's there's not a day he doesn't go doesn't go by that he doesn't talk to the next door neighbour. <laughs> there isn't. Great yeah. to hear that he has yeah. have that network base. How did you uh, set probably, your own network your probably, base up? Probably, probably not as much as he does. I had my photography base for a long time, um, but then COVID hit and I moved away from that sector. I am slowly starting to build up another community base, um, but it, it's it's tough when you're a little bit older and everyone else is set in their own communities. But yeah, yeah, and no, I have a few that I can ring and. And have a whinge too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that as well. And so while you're doing balancing all the hats of the support person and raising the kids and everything else, is there something that you do for yourself? I've taken on a new business. So no new projects, but this one was taken on a couple of years ago. So it doesn't count as this year. Um and it's been it's actually been amazing for my self-esteem and getting out there and meeting people and that sort of stuff so I've just I've really enjoyed um helping people helping them grow as well that's my little project plus I'm a bit of a a hands-on I like a bit of you know furniture renovations I like to (laughs) grow my plants um I'm actually I grow everything inside. I can't grow anything outside. I can see the indoor plants behind you. <laughs> they, all, they all do really well indoors. As soon as I put them outside, they die. So I'm just like, I'll just grow plants in this, this room here. 
if any of those listening who are having trouble doing plants <laughs> outside, bring them inside. Yes, I have like a little herb garden over in the corner inside as well because I just, I don't know, they get forgotten outside. So what is your new business? And you said you've enjoyed networking and talking to people and helping people. So what is it that you do? So I'm working for a network marketing company. Um, we sell shampoo and it's I needed the shampoo for my hair. So when I when I first started, I my hair was disgusting, gross, revolting, um, and I was sick of feeling like that farmer's wife that didn't, you know, slopped around in her trackies, didn't care much for her appearance. I just got really down that mum path where you just don't worry about yourself because you're so focused on everyone else um, and saw a chance during COVID and jumped on it really like I was just like it's time to do something for me like it's time to feel good about myself um so I jumped on on the shampoo bandwagon and um have been helping other people jump on the shampoo bandwagon and enjoy their hair as well (laughs) pretty much that's really good to hear because I know from so many other community their hair is really something they struggle with when they move to the farm and I know for some listening, they'll be like, what? But yeah. whether you're going from town water to bore water, dam water, whatever your water system is, sometimes mm-hmm. your hair just doesn't bounce back the way it, it used to. It the water is a big factor, like a huge factor. And so can stress, like the stress of the farm sometimes can get to you and that can be a huge factor in hair growth and, and how your hair's feeling as well. So if I can make people, you know, just feel that little bit, hmm, I feel good today, you know, um, then, yeah, I know, I've done, I've had a good day if I can do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'm yeah. going to add your social media links in the comments below um, so that people can, if they're worrying, worrying about their hair or they're having trouble now they've moved to the farm with it, they can yep. reach out to you. So that kind of comes to the end of my official questions. Is there any additional tips, tricks, hacks and advice or stories of overcoming hurdles that you wanted to cover on today's podcast episode? I think maybe get your kids involved. Yep. Okay, from a young age. I probably didn't do it enough. I was a little bit timid and wasn't sure what I should be doing coming from the city and being thrown into it. But if you get your kids involved in more of the farm work, um, I'll give them their own little project as well. My kids have their own egg business. It started in 2020 when we were in lockdown. They got 100 baby chickens and raised them, and now they sell eggs through the local store down here. Um, so they've been doing that for four years now. It's been a huge learning curve for me and for them, <laughs> especially when it comes to foxes and that. We had another fox yeah. attack the other day, so that was a bit heartbreaking. but. It's all part of it, isn't it? That was one of my life lessons when I first moved down here was where there's livestock, there's dead stock, Nicole. You need to just get over it. (laughs) Their first farm project being chickens as well. So now we sell eggs on our roadside stand at the front gate for them. (laughs) Perfect. It's such a good little thing to do. My kids will moan and that about having to do it every day because it's an everyday job. Yeah. But when they see that money trickle into their account because they get paid yeah. um, monthly for it, uh, they're, yeah, they're very happy. <laughs> yes. But all the other jobs they don't get paid for, all the other jobs are just life. That's yeah. their chickens they get paid for, yeah. What other jobs on farm would you encourage them to get involved with? So my 15, our 15-year-old, 15 Riley, he was has been driving a tractor since he was four like literally I got a phone call from Trent I could see two tractors over in the distance coming towards the house and I was like there's only Trent and Riley out there how can there be two anyway I rang Trent I was like what why is that tractor moving oh Riley's driving it I'm just like oh my god I did I had a heart attack but and now he's he's 15 and and put in a full year of harvest for the first time this year um so worked alongside Trent from sun up till sundown you know once the school holidays hit and I think just giving them that independence knowing they can do it the other the other three younger ones have been a bit harder because Riley's always taken the reins and said I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it so getting them to step up a little bit when he's not here is a bit like oh they're like oh where's Riley why can't he do it (laughs) 
So so we're we're training those guys now to to step mm-hmm. up and they they move that train will ring and go, the kids need to move this sheep into this paddock and they'll jump on their motorbikes and go and do that or move the cattle or something like that. Yeah. 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 And for you guys, is that assessing not so much their age, but their ability and then the supervision level for those tasks as well? How do you make the judgment call on making sure that they are safe and they are able to do those jobs? Yeah, I think it's it's not an age thing. It's just yeah. their capability. Probably two, three years ago, I wouldn't have sent the youngest out to move the cattle, but he has been going with Trent a lot more with the cattle now. And so he's understanding the safety and when he's in the in the um, paddocks on his bike, he knows what he's supposed to do and that. It's just taking them with you so that they learn as they go. It's it's not about it's not it's not something you can write on paper and say this is what you need to do. It's letting them get in there and do it and make the mistakes. They make mistakes all the time. Um, but they're learning every time they make them. And sometimes that's better than trying to teach them. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes I know. It sounds like it's been a nice gradual introduction to those jobs as well. So yeah. they're coming with you, you know, they're then learning under supervision how to use the bikes and how the cattle move and the paddocks because they're already familiar with it because they've been with you and then going yeah. up from there based on their, their competence yeah. level. Yeah, and now he can ring and th- the three of them can go out and move a mob of sheep together without me, without him, yeah. and get it done, no worries. Bringing up your own little work, Scott. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's why we had them, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Beautiful thing. A chat with me today and for coming on So You've Married a Farmer. Now what? Thank you so much for having me and I hope I've helped someone out there. I'm absolutely sure that you have. <laughs> <laughs>